Hello everybody and welcome to this A-Level Chemistry exam question walkthrough video. In this video I'll be looking at a question about aromatic chemistry and as ever I'll be showing you my thoughts behind the question in blue and then the answers that are going to get you the actual marks they will be shown in green. If you want to have a go at the question first and then mark it alongside the video then the PDF file is available in the description for you to download. This question is a classic organic chemistry question that combines knowledge of mechanisms being tested and also chemical testing on some of the reactants and products. So in this question we're told that compound X, which has got this formula here, which is shown in a little bit more detail down in the equation, is used in an organic synthesis as shown in this equation. And we've been given a reaction flow where we've got benzene on the left hand side reacting with this chemical X in the presence of aluminium chloride. So that should be making us think it's a certain type of reaction. And then we've got product P and HCl as a byproduct. And so we've been given a big clue as what's happening here because we've been asked to draw the structure of the electrophile formed from the reaction of X with aluminium chloride. And so, as you can see, I've redrawn X in the space here, and I've drawn aluminium chloride out in terms of its displayed formula. And what actually happens is, because aluminium is in group 3 and it's attached to three chlorines, typically you'd expect it to be a trigonal planar arrangement. But I wanted to show here that what can happen is a coordinate bond can form between the chlorine and this aluminium, and that has the effect of breaking this bond here. And so overall, what we're left with is an electrophile which takes the form of this acylium ion over here with a chlorine attached to it. And so really all you're doing when you're generating the electrophile is you're breaking away the chlorine from this acyl chloride, which is just a little bit fancier than a normal acyl chloride because it's got chlorine on the other end as well. But in terms of the generation of the electrophile, it behaves in exactly the same way. And so this will be the formula of the electrophile that gets produced. And then we're asked to outline the mechanism for the reaction of the electrophile from part A1 with benzene in the preparation of P. And so the electrophile we've just drawn is going to be attracted to the electron-rich benzene ring. And so we draw the curly arrow whenever we're doing electrophilic substitution mechanisms, which is what this type of mechanism is. It's a shame, sometimes they give you credit for actually stating the name of the mechanism, but not here. So even though we talk about the electrophile attacking the benzene ring, the rule of mechanisms is we're showing the movement of electrons. So the curly arrow has to start at that pi cloud, which is symbolized by the circle, and it points out to where the positive charge is on the electrophile. That's stage one, and that will be a mark for that curly arrow. And then stage two, you can see that we've got an intermediate produced, which can't possibly be stable because it's positively charged. And we can see that the delocalized electron cloud has been disturbed, which is why it only goes two thirds of the way around. And so overall, it is positively charged. But you can also see that the carbon at the top has got two bonds attached to it, which is what's preventing that pi cloud going all the way around. And so what happens is the bond between the carbon and the hydrogen breaks. That pair of electrons moves into the center, back to the pi cloud, restoring the six delocalized electrons in the benzene ring and producing this. Although the question hasn't asked for it, which is why I'm showing it in blue, because unless the question asks for it, you'd never need to show the organic product of a mechanism. And then we move on to show that we could, in this mechanism, make Q, which is an alternative product. And we've been asked to describe a simple test tube reaction that we could use to distinguish between P and Q and include the observations that we would make. And so if we look at P at the top of the screen, we can see that we've got a chlorine atom attached to the carbon group here, and then we've got the carbonyl, and then we've got the benzene ring. So effectively, in terms of chemical tests you need to know, this is effectively a halogenoalkane because there isn't really a chemical test for benzene or for the carbonyl group, particularly given it's a ketone, for A-level chemistry. Whereas if we look at Q, we've still got the benzene ring and we've got a bit of a hydrocarbon section in the middle, but at the end here we've got this group, which you do need to know is an acyl chloride. 
and there's two ways of testing here. One is for the acyl chloride part, and that would prove that we have got Q if we were distinguishing between the two. So the reagent that you would use here is water, and P would do nothing, so we would write, of course, no observable change or no visible change. We wouldn't write nothing, so no visible change for P, whereas Q would give us the fumes, the misty white fumes of hydrogen chloride. You don't need to say what the gas is that's being produced, but the misty white fumes are hydrogen chloride. Alternatively, we could try and prove the presence of that halogen, so we could use silver nitrate. Now Q, because it's an acyl chloride, this chlorine leaves very, very readily. So we would get a white precipitate formed immediately. Whereas with P, it would leave, that halogen would leave because it would get substituted out by the water from the solution. But it would take a long time. So I would be tempted to say that in this context, you would say the observation with P would be no visible change. But honestly, the precipitate would form slowly. So they would accept that as well as a possible answer. Then the second part of this question actually moves away from aromatic chemistry and dabbles in carbonyl chemistry and then in alkenes. And that's not really a big surprise because it's rare to find an organic chemistry question that is only about one of the particular strands of organic chemistry. So we need to be prepared for that, particularly given we've just been acylating a benzene ring and so it's not a surprise that they move from there to talk to us about different ways that the carbonyl group can react. And so in part C, we're told that X can be used to make the compound which has the formula like so. And this compound can be polymerized to make a polymer PGA, which is used in surgical sutras. In part one, we're asked to draw the repeating unit of PGA. And so before we draw out that repeating structure, I've redrawn the compound that is going to form the polymer in the first place. And what we need to recognize is that the left-hand side of this molecule, we've got an alcohol group. And on the right-hand side, we've got the carboxylic acid group. So it's a bit like in the polymerization topic where you have a diol and a dicarboxylic acid making a polyester. But it's not quite like that because this molecule itself has the two different functional groups in it kind of like when an amino acid joins with other amino acids to make a protein. And so what's going to happen here is this is going to make a condensation polymer, and so we will lose the H from the alcohol group and the OH from the carboxylic acid group of a neighbouring molecule, and we'll make a polymer. And so the repeating unit of PGA will look like this which is effectively what I've drawn initially, or what we started with, just without the H on the left-hand side and without the OH on the right-hand side. Mark schemes like this are sometimes forgiving and allow you to move the oxygen from one side to the other, but I would recommend keeping it like this because that shows you what the original monomer was and where this came from. And then we're moving on to look at how two of these same molecules that we've already drawn react together to make a cyclic compound. So that means it's going to be a ring and it makes two molecules of water as well. And so that's significant because if we just go back to part one, every time one of these monomers joins with another, we're going to get water forming from that link, the OH from one of them and the H from the neighbouring one. And what we're told here is that effectively this is going to happen twice because we're going to make two H2Os. So what we're going to do is we're going to end up making two ester links between our two molecules, but it is going to be part of a ring. And so if we have a look, what's going to happen is the O of one of these molecules is going to attack the carbonyl carbon of a neighbouring molecule, which is what happens during the polymerization process. And you can see that I've drawn two of these molecules out and I'm going to circle the water that's going to form. So what's going to happen is the O to H from one of the carboxylic acid groups is going to make water with the H from the alcohol. And so we'll get a new bond forming like so. And then the same thing will happen at the other end. That OH from the acid will leave along with the H from the alcohol and we'll get another new bond forming like so. So overall, what we're going to get is this structure, which is a hexagon shaped structure, although the precise shape is probably very forgiving, but it would be hexagon shaped because that's the most stable. And we've got two carbonyl groups on the outside and we've got two oxygens at either end of the hexagon like so.
And we could show it as CO instead of that C double bond O, by the way, in terms of the structure. And then the question moves on to addition polymerization, which is what happens in alkenes when they make polyalkenes. And so we're working with polypropene, and we've been asked to draw the repeating structure of polypropene. Now, clearly, again, we could just dive straight in with the right answer. But to help you out, I'm going to draw the monomer, which is, of course, an alkene. And when you ever draw any alkene, I always strongly recommend you start with that double bond between the two carbon atoms, not least because it reminds you in some situations to work out EZ isomerism. Not necessary here, but what is necessary is we need to make it into propene like so. There's the third carbon making it prop, and then the other positions will be the hydrogen. So again, this encourages you to get the planar structure, the 120 degree angle around that double bond. And so if you remember what happens when you make a polyalkene, and this is why this is so important to get your structure right in the first instance, is that double bond opens up and becomes a single bond. So I'm just going to make it into one wide single bond like so. And then what happens is the carbon chain grows from both of those two carbon atoms that had that double bond and now don't. And so you grow it out from the sides like so. And by doing that, that helps you to avoid falling into the trap of having the repeat unit with all three carbons in a row inside the brackets, which is, is of course wrong. Whenever you're drawing the repeat unit for any polyalkene, it's always two carbon atoms next to each other, and then the only bit that varies is what is it that's going in the two positions above, the H and the CH3 in this instance, and the H and the H below. That's the only source of variation that you can get. And then last of all, we're asked to suggest an advantage of surgical sutras made from PGA rather than polypropene, and then explain our answer. So the main advantage for comparing a polyalkene to a polyester or any similar you know, polyamide as well is that polyesters such as PGA are going to be biodegradable. Now, there are going to be a lot of different answers, but essentially they all break down to the fact that the polymer can be broken down. So... PGA sutures will react, they'll dissolve, they'll break down, they'll be biodegradable, they could be hydrolyzed, which is the act of breaking up that chain. And crucially, this is going to be by something like water or nucleophiles. So in terms of a practical sense, these stitches don't need to be removed. They will just dissolve and eventually just not be there anymore once they've served their purpose. And then the explanation is, why is it that they can do that that polyalkenes can't? Well, the polyester link itself is a polar bond. It's nothing to do with any side chains or anything like that. It is the skeleton of the polyester chain is polar, whereas the skeleton of a polyalkene is always non-polar. Whatever's going off on the side, that can vary, but the skeleton of a polyalkene is always non-polar. And we could come at it from either angle. We could say polyalkene's non-polar, etc. But it doesn't matter. Essentially, we just need to make that distinction between the two different types of polymer. Okay, that's the end of this question and this video. Hope it was useful. I'll see you again soon.